Well, thank you very much for coming. Sorry, we had a, a, a little bit of a delay. Uh, how many of you were here yesterday? Completely, uh, one, two, two people, okay. Generally a new crowd. How many of you were here for Professor Rich's lecture? Because we have some overlap with that as well. Um, so David asked me to speak to you about bilateral investment treaty claims in the context of government change. And I have given, I, I think I had about four or five of these presentations that I kept throwing out the window and thinking, no, this isn't quite good enough. So I've now um, settled on an old spaghetti western. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so in order to understand what the good, the bad, and the ugly are in the context of bid arbitration, let me give you a little bit of an introduction about what this whole bit arbitration system is and how it developed, why it's important. Um, political risk, which is what bilateral investment treaties are about, um, is as old as the hills. There's always been, so long as there has been some government, there has always been some government expropriating people's property. Kind of goes with the territory. Um, but there's also always been political risk protection in the context of uh, classical antiquity and from there onwards, the idea really was the principle of hospitality, which protected foreigners coming into uh, new communities, trading out of those new communities, and then later on, this kind of hospitality was formalized in one form or another in what's called the king's peace. So, you know, if you think about trade, in uh, antiquity, the Middle Ages, after that, there always was trade, there always was a protection of trade by the government against uh, expropriation in one form or another that was actionable. Um, and in more modern times, the typical ways that political risks were dealt with included uh, diplomatic protection, meaning that the government that is the home state of the investor would assert its political power, its foreign policy power on behalf of the investor against the host state in order to achieve reparation. There are many famous public international law cases and many infamous uh, diplomatic incidents where military force was used in order to vindicate investor rights. Uh, there were insurance contracts, one of our sponsor institutions, USAID, used to be in the business of writing political insurance, uh, political risk insurance and political risk guarantees, and there was the ability of investors to protect themselves as best they could by contract. Um, the problem with all of these forms of political risk protection was that they were relatively, uh, and again, relatively ineffectual. Investors didn't have freestanding international rights uh, to proceed against the government as a matter of international law. And what the BIT paradigm, when I say BIT, what I mean is there are treaties out there um, that protect investors. And these treaties fundamentally changed the game. What they did was they extended the right to foreign investors to arbitrate their disputes with the host state with regard to political risk, meaning the risk of expropriation, the risk of unreasonable political impairment, the risk of discrimination, um, to arbitrate these claims as a matter of public international law and deemed these awards to be enforceable as a matter of public international law as well. So what the game changer was that now you had investors who were private individuals, companies, have direct rights as a matter of public international law and no longer rights that were intermediated by means of their home state. These treaties extended a hosts of protections to foreign investors 
namely uh, the substantive protection against expropriation, substantive protection against discrimination on the basis of their nationality, substantive protection of protection, meaning that they would receive legal protection, an effective court, in, court remedy in which to voice their claims and protection of their physical property against intrusion. And the most important of all, it turns out, a protection called fair and equitable treatment. Um, there are now uh, multiple of thousands of bilateral investment treaties in place. About, I want to say, 170 countries at least have signed them. The countries that have signed bilateral investment treaties recently include Venezuela and Iran. They, in fact, have signed a bilateral investment treaty together. So has Cuba. So these are the kind of countries that you would never associate with bilateral investment treaties. And here they are entering into these treaties nonetheless with each other, which goes to show you just about how far and wide this paradigm has, has grown since really uh, taking off in earnest in about the 1980s, 1990s. Um, now, as I said, fair and equitable treatment, before I get to the good, the bad, and the ugly, to give you a little bit of introduction, fair and equitable treatment is the fundamental concept in all of the disputes, really, that have been brought in the BIT era. Now, when I talk to you about fair and equitable, what, what comes to your mind first? What does the government have to do to be fair and equitable to foreign investors? Any ideas? Yeah. They have to protect expectation interests. And in a, a uh, civilian context, despite the fact that the, the, the norm is fundamentally a US treaty norm coming out of its um, friendship, commerce, and navigation treaties in a, US, uh, in, a, in a civilian context, it means that the government has to treat investors fundamentally with good faith. Um, meaning it must take investors seriously. Um, it must secure the reasonable investment-backed expectations with which investors enter the country. And we've heard about reasonable investment-backed expectations before in the takings context. Um, now, as you can imagine, government change has a significant impact on fair and equitable treatment, because every time that a government changes, there is a very good chance that policy will change. And every time that policy changes, there is a very good chance that the investor is no longer getting what it expected to get out of its investment. Does that mean that every time a government changes, all investors come running and bring fair and equitable treatment claims? Well, I guess I wish, but no. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to two and a half cases in the context of the good, by which I mean run-of-the-mill regulatory change that occurs as a result of changes of heart uh, in the ordinary democratic process. The cases that I would like to discuss with you involve the host states of Mexico, Lithuania, and Turkey all of them democratic countries. Um, and so these are really the mildest cases of political risk in many ways. The first one, as I keep trying to find a way to get my page to stay, ha! Um, the first one is Tecmed v. Mexico. What happened in Tecmed v. Mexico? Tecmed, a Spanish company, acquired a um, controlled hazardous industrial waste landfill facility. Uh, now, we talked about these kinds of 
facilities before in Bill's lecture with regard to takings. What happens if you know, we have something, not, not a landfill, but you know, a munitions factory, a uh, pig farm? What happens when the town grows and all of a sudden it abuts this landfill? And this is essentially what happened in this case. Um, in 1996, the regulator essentially swapped a long-term licensing agreement with one-year licenses, and there was an issue with regard to the licensing. There was an attempt to relocate the landfill, which the investor agreed to, and um, the investor essentially said, well, until you find me new land, I obviously want to operate my landfill here, just as I've always done. And it appeared that there was agreement on this, but in 1998, lo and behold, the permit was revoked. And it was revoked because of a change in local government that had succumbed to pressure, as would ordinarily be the case. I mean, if you lived next to a chemical waste landfill, you'd pressure your government too, right? I would. Um, and um, so it was shut down. Now, here, the question was whether or not we had a fair and equitable treatment violation in this case. And TechMed is famous for its beautiful and canonical language describing what the fair and equitable treatment standard requires. It requires treatment of the investor in good faith that um, the state has to act in a reasonably consistent, transparent, and predictable manner that would allow the investor essentially to organize their affairs ahead of time. And well, in this case, that really plainly wasn't the case, right? I mean, if on one hand you say, well, we're going to relocate you and you can have the landfill here until we find you a place to relocate to. And there's a, there's a famous acronym in, in, in the US context, NIMBY, not in my backyard. If you are trying, somebody who tried to move a chemical landfill to your backyard, you'd keep protesting, right? So nobody wanted to have that landfill in their backyard. So eventually, the promise, we're going to move you and you can operate until we move you was violated. Now, this is one of the good cases in the sense that there was no evil intent on anybody's part. There was just an ordinary regulatory process working in a way as it should. And in that context, we had a violation of fair and equitable treatment of the investor because, well, even though this is the ordinary process and you can kind of see it happening, fairly if you allow an investor to come in and you give them long-term licenses, and within the term of the long-term license, you change the licensing structure, and then you revoke the license in the term of the licensing structure, and then you don't allow them to do what you'd promised them to do. That sounds like, it, no, while not in bad faith, certainly isn't in good faith. It certainly isn't transparent. It certainly isn't something where you could reasonably build an enterprise into the future. So there we had a fair and equitable treatment violation just in the ordinary course of governmental change. Now, let's consider a different case. In fact, it's not all too different. Parkering's Kampaniet v. Lithuania, uh, somewhat more prosaic in terms of what the investment was, but it was a parking structure in Vilnius. Parkering's Kampaniet, a uh, Norwegian company, joined a consortium to build a parking structure in Vilnius. The issue was, well, how are we going to you know, pay for this stuff? What is the parking fee going to be like? And um, they came up with a structure in both the city of Vilnius and the investor was trying to figure out by way of legal opinion whether this was going to be permissible. Um, the city's legal opinion said, no, it wasn't. The investor's legal opinion said, yes, it was. The city never disclosed its legal opinion. Um, what happened then was that the national government kind of un understood what was going on there and, inter and, and, and intervened, changed several laws that um, made it impossible to proceed on the basis that the consortium and Vilnius had agreed. That put the consortium of which the foreign investor was a party in breach and the contract was terminated. Um, and made a claim for breach of fair and equitable treatment. What was interesting in that case was that the tribunal expressly looked to a line of cases that said, well, 
good faith is a relative standard. We need to take into account who your host state is and to say that you could have a reasonable um, expectation of legislative stability in Lithuania given its recent past and given its attempts to join the European Union and change its laws in order to be consistent with European regulations would be asking just a little bit too much. In, those inst in that particular case, it said, well, look, if the investor would have asked for a stability agreement to stabilize the framework or would have gotten any kind of affirmation by the government that, in fact, it wouldn't change its regulatory structure, maybe there would have been a claim. But absent that, the fact that Lithuania was who Lithuania was, there was not in that case a fair and equitable treatment violation. Um, now, if you compared those two cases, what do you think is the fundamental difference between those two cases that allowed the TechMed tribunal to say, okay, we have a fair and equitable treatment violation, whereas the Parkerings Company it's tribunal to say, no, there isn't. If you had to make them consistent with each other, What's the fundamental thing that you could look to? Yeah. What would be the, why were they different? The, the, the expectations reasonably could be argued to be different. Why? So, so Mexico had not just emerged from Soviet rule, fair enough. Uh, anything else? Because that would be a very thin read to, to, to really place one's faith in. Because then you're saying, well, certain countries just get better treatment than other countries. That's kind of weird, right? I mean, to say that, well, good faith, yes. But only, you know, good faith means one thing if you're Mexico. It means another thing if you're Lithuania. Is there anything else that would be different between these two cases? And I know you haven't read them, so it, 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 it sort of have you noticed something in my description of what happened? The fundamental difference, just to give you the answer, the fundamental difference, if you wanted to reconcile them, is that in one case, Mexico, or, you know, a, a organization slash uh, a, entities whose acts could be attributed to Mexico made representations to the investor in the form of licenses, in the form of statements that, no, we're going to find you another place, and until we find you the other place, of course you can operate here. And then they didn't abide those terms. So you had a representation and a violation of the representation, whereas the very technical reading in, in, in Park Herring's company, it would say, no, you, you didn't have a sufficient representation. Nobody told you the framework was gonna stay the same. Nobody told you that um, you could operate this parking structure in this way um, if you so desired. Well, it's a very thin read because there was a negotiation with a municipality. There was a contract. There was a, um, a an expectation that to the extent the city knew that what it was doing could be considered illegal, it should at least speak up. But that's where probably it came in that you had this differentiation between in, uh, development status and between both countries to say, well, we can expect a certain kind of transparency on one end, but maybe not quite as much on the other. Um, now, one can have opinions about whether Park Herring's company got it right or didn't get it right. And I'm not gonna, let me not share my personal opinion with you on that because I think it's really important that you make up your own mind on these kind of issues because, you know, jurisprudence is split on that. Um, the one, and the, the half case I wanted to discuss with you before moving to the bad is PSEG v. Turkey. That case found one fundamental exception to the rule that is emerging in fair and equitable treatment, that you really do need some form of representation from the government, uh, direct or implied, that the investor can say was violated. And that was, if you have a roller coaster ride of constantly changing regulations, that also would be a fair and equitable treatment violation. So if, you know, every three months something new comes out and it fundamentally throws your plans overboard and you really cannot ever predict 
what it is that you need to do. You don't need to have a stability agreement. That kind of an environment is so non-transparent, according to PSEG, as to be a fair and equitable treatment violation all of its own right. It's a half case in this context because it really re refers more to the regulatory state than to government change. So if you have a regulatory state that keeps changing its mind about how legislation is implemented, that would be more of a problem. It's not really a problem that the government keeps voting new laws. I mean, the parliaments are not that prolific, I don't think. Um, so what we come to in the context of the good is that so long as regulation is not an unfair surprise to the investor, given where it started out, we don't have a fair and equitable treatment claim. Um, it, it, it's arguable whether or not unfair surprise is some form of absolute standard that you'd set or whether you have a, a floating relative standard in that context and there are various arguments for and against setting an absolute standard or not. But that is how regulatory change or government change would work in the context of bit claims with, I'm going to call them good governments, for current purposes. Now, next, we have the bad. Uh, the two cases I want to talk to you about are Yukos, or the various Yukos cases against the Russian Federation, and Fraport v. Philippines. Now, a disclaimer. I acted as counsel directly in Fraport v. Philippines, and I acted as counsel for Yukos Oil Company, not in the bid claims, but so you know my bias with regard to these cases. Um, now, I would assume some of you may know what happened in Yukos. Anyone want to give it a stab? No? No? Okay. Um, so, Yukos was a vertically integrated oil company. Um, it's a uh, head figure in many ways, and one of the key owners was Mikhail Khodorkovsky. He um, was a political threat to President Putin at the time. Um, who had attempted at that time to clean house with the Russian oligarchs. Now, why, wait a minute, why is this a government change case? Well, what you have to understand in that context, an it's an attitude change. Well, what, what happened was that when Yeltsin could no longer really run for election for president, the oligarchs all got together and tried to figure out which figurehead are we going to choose who will run this country for us. Um, and they settled on this person whom they considered a very weak person who would never amount to anything, Vladimir Putin. Who's ever heard of the man? Let's prop him up to be president. Uh, and organized television events and propped him up. And there he was, president of Russia with the help of the privately owned television stations and all the money the oligarchs could throw his way except he had slightly misunderstood the man. He was, he was not quite the insignificant figure that they thought he was. So why is it government change? It's government change because there was an internal power change within the Russian government. The Siloviki, the, the, the uh, well now FSB hardliners and his St. Petersburg crowd replaced more and more the oligarch power structure within the Russian government. And it is this new power structure, that, the power struggle with the oligarchs, led to a certain extent by Khodorkovsky, who presented a significant threat with regard to strategic industry, namely oil and gas industry, to Russian foreign policy. Khodorkovsky suggested building pipelines into directions that uh, Russia at the time was not really all that keen building pipelines to. Um, and I, I doubt that I would have to mention in this forum what Russia does with pipelines. Um, so this was more than just a commercial threat. Um, now, what happened next is that he was arrested on October 25 by FSB agents on his private plane in Siberia. And now the clock started ticking. What 
what happened to Yukos Oil Company? Well, um, first, on November 17, the tax ministry recertified all taxes were good and paid. That didn't last long. December 8, the tax ministry reopened the uh, tax audit, an extraordinary tax audit for the taxation year of 2000. Um, within less than a month's time, 21 days, they found a tax arrear of $3.5 billion. And from there on out, billion after billion, freeze order after freeze order, arrest after arrest, auction after auction, bankruptcy after bankruptcy, the, com the company was destroyed upside down, inside out, lawyers jailed, um, and uh, abuses committed beyond belief. I was counsel for them, I, I, so thus the, the, the emphasis. Um, now, various companies have filed bit claims and ECT claims against the Russian Federation with regard to this type of activity, which I call the bad. Um, currently, the majority owners of um, Yukos Oil Company have somewhere around $100 billion worth of claims pending. Uh, several smaller um, investors have also brought claims, and the smaller claims have already gone to award, and these smaller claims um, called the conduct what it was, fundamentally confiscatory, not in good faith, and um, awarded damages to the investors involved. What I would note is that in this regard, the BIT tribunals were a good bit more courageous than the European Court of Human Rights. The BIT tribunals went a good bit further in stating that Russia's behavior was fundamentally unacceptable in violation of international law and as such should um, be called to account. We haven't yet gotten the big claims um, all the way to award and we're sort of anxiously waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, now, what is important here is that the key defense, of course, in all these claims was that Yukos violated our law, um, tax law in that case, and um, that didn't work in these particular bid claims, despite the fact, and this is, I think, where the ECHR and the bid claims fundamentally differed. Why did they go differently? It's that the, the, the bid tribunal stated that, yes, Russia does make plausible arguments, but it didn't extend them a margin of appreciation. There was no margin of appreciation doctrine in the context of bid tribunals that would say, well, if it's plausible, we're going to give you deference um, to these arguments. There was a thorough investigation, and therefore the bid tribunals could go further than a human rights court in that context. Um, the second case, Fraport v. Philippines, is similarly bad, but not quite as atrocious as Yukos. What happened in that case was uh, you had an airport terminal, that was being built, and you had two rival bidders. One was an insider, um, and the other was an outsider. The outsider provided a much better bid for the Philippine government, and two administrations fundamentally signed off on it and said, yes, we're going to go with this bid. Um, the project company um, agreed with Fraport, if any of you have flown to the Frankfurt airport, Fraport, to become a partner in the venture, and uh, Fraport put in several hundred millions of dollars into building an airport terminal. Uh, problem was, there was a new government that came into power. The new government did not align itself with the people who had won the bid. They had aligned themselves with the people who lost the bid. So now there was an attempt, according to what Fraport pled um, in the arbitration. I'm saying that this way because two counsel for Fraport were, were sued, and uh, I believe the cases are still ongoing, for libel, for uh, statements made in a pleading. Um, <laughs> thus, allegedly. Um, uh, so, uh, allegedly, the government sought to push out the uh, Filipino partners in this venture, and allegedly sought to bring in their pals into the venture. That didn't work, at which point the Supreme Court 
Niftali declared the concession agreement null and void, and the airport was expropriated. Uh, to this day, Fraport really hasn't gotten all that much money in return in compensation, despite the fact that there's an airport terminal that's now running that's perfectly good. I've flown into it. Um, and um, that, you know, Fraport had spent $400 million or, well, somewhere in that neighborhood on building the terminal. Um, now, what is interesting is, of course, that the Philippines in the proceedings alleged all sorts of wrongs, corruption, violation of laws, and all that. And uh, there was a first award which determined that Fraport had, in fact, violated a law called the Anti-Dummy Law of the Philippines, which prohibits foreign companies from um, essentially taking control through officers, employees, or laborers of this type of company. Um, that decision was annulled at a later stage, and we're now back to a new proceeding. Um, the key, why do I juxtapose Fraport, another one of the bad, with Yukos? Well, in that case, the first tribunal fundamentally bought that, well, if you were in bed with the previous government, you must have done something wrong. And um, in the Yukos case, it didn't buy the, if you were in bed with the previous government, you must have done something wrong, i.e., you know, hoodwink the tax man. Um, so the bad cases are the kind of cases where you're going to see um, fundamental uh, claims about the illegality of investor conduct in order to mask just the sheer um, size of the host state conduct. By the time that you take north of $400 million and you don't want to pay compensation, there better be something wrong with what the investor do had done, right? And that's what these cases are all about. So these cases fundamentally turn on counsel's ability to plead these cases in a way to um, convince the tribunal that the investor acted in a manner that was, in fact, in accordance with the host state laws. Something that is very important, at the, I'm going to get to at the end, of how you actually structure your investments to, um, to fix this. Now we get to the plain ugly. Um, sometimes you have geopolitical collateral damage. I'm talking about situations like what we currently have in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. Um, fundamentally, a foreign government has brought about, and I don't have to say allegedly in this case, um, a change in government by armed force in a part of the host state. I don't have to say allegedly because I think President Putin gladly admitted to the fact that there were, in fact, Russian soldiers in Crimea that were the ones running around. Um, now, what happened next is similarly predictable. The expropriation started occurring, and they're probably going to occur in the near future to an even greater extent. One of the companies that was expropriated is Wind Farms of Ukraine. Wind Farms of Ukraine had significant funding from foreign banks, including European debt financing, and, well, they're now looking for ways to figure out what on earth are we going to do about that. Um, the problem in this context for the bit paradigm is that you ordinarily can only claim against your host state. How on earth are we going to bring a claim against Russia would be the question. Does, does the bit paradigm protect you this far? What I would like to suggest to you is that maybe it could. Um, one theory that one might try is that of successor government. To say that, well, assuming for a moment that um, Russia were the successor government in, Ukra in Crimea, given that Crimea has declared independence and then voted to join Russia, there is a theory you could thread that would, under the Vienna Convention on the Law of State Succession, permit an argument that you simply sue Russia under the Ukraine bits in place at the time, which the investor relied upon 
in making the investment and hopefully took into consideration in structuring the investment. That would probably be the easiest way to do this simply because an investor would not have structured through a Russian bit for making or a, a bit structure that would allow claims against Russia making an investment in Ukraine. And that would have required a foresight that probably was beyond the scope of what investors could reasonably have invested, uh, expected to make. So here, the successor state theory is probably the best way to go about it. Um, you could also try, if you had a better Russian bit, by all means, bring a claim directly under a Russian bit or under an old Soviet era bit as to which both Ukraine and Russia arguably are successor states. There are currently claims pending against Kazakhstan on the theory that Kazakhstan is a successor state to the Soviet Union. Um, so you could also try that. In all of these cases, Russia in any event should be stopped from asserting that it is not actually um, in charge of the territory of Crimea given its actions, and I'd pr I'm pretty sure that bit tribunals would be courageous enough to say that. Um, so that would be one way in which companies stuck in the position of wind farms of Ukraine and the financiers of wind farms of Ukraine could bring claims with regard to the ugly geopolitical collateral damage. The other thing which is even more interesting but even more controversial is you could, if you had the right investment structure, bring claims against Russia on the basis of a Russian sub to the extent that the Russian sub and you had a Ukrainian sub and the two of them did close business together. In the NAFTA context, uh, high fructose corn syrup led to a lot of those cases because you had US parents that sold high fructose corn syrup to Mexican subs and the Mexican subs claimed against Mexico when there was a sugar war between Mexico and the United States and in the Cargill case uh, the Cargill tribunal fundamentally stated that yes we are going to compensate Cargill to Mexico for Cargill's losses in this instance because Cargill to Mexico's business model fundamentally included these profits already so so long as you can prove that you don't even have to prove a successor state theory you just have to prove that the two companies involved had such a close business connection that you can claim for all sorts of things that the Russian Federation did illegally in Ukraine that interrupted your business and therefore impaired your investment in Russia. Um, that is probably going to be the most complicated legal theory to win on, but it's available to defeat the ugly. So looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly, the bit paradigm fundamentally permits you to address government change that is benign, yeah, not so benign, and maleficent. I have to make a little bit of Disney promotion at this point. Um, so these three types of government change can be brought into the frame if you've structured your investment at the outset correctly. What do you need to do? You, you, you set up a structure, what do you need to do in order to find the right way to do this? Well, the first step is to find a legal structure that would permit you to get good bit protection and good tax treaty protection. Don't just think about bits, think about tax too. Because if you have a bit structure that protects you and a tax st structure that's gonna have you pay out the nose, your clients are not gonna be very happy about that. Um, the, the, Good thing is that most states that offer good tax treaties also offer good investment treaties. The Netherlands is one of them, so that you could do a Dutch sandwich. Um, and you can frequently look at the relevant treaties that are available and compare the two. I would say look at the bits. Not all bits are worded equally, but fundamentally a lot of the bits have more similarity in protection than the tax treaties would. So that is how you would look at the first step. Okay, now I've found a bit. Um, I found the right bit structure I'm going to invest through the Netherlands in wherever it is that I'm going to invest. Check. Now, the problem is that this is not where it ends. The bad should show you that you need to document everything you do with the government in order to preempt any kind of allegation that you acted in violation of host state law. 
everything that goes to the government, every payment that you make, um, should be in light of the experience that we've had with very crafty Respondents' Council, documented in such a way as to put the uh, Council for the Investor and in Bid Proceedings in the best position possible to shoot down whatever clever legal theories Respondents' Council might advance. Um, now, the other thing that you need to do is less about the bad and more about the good. You need to run thorough due diligence. If the requirement is that you show that you have a reasonable investment-backed expectation, that the regulatory framework would not change in a certain way, you need to explain why that's the case. If you just say, well, laws don't change, that's not going to work. Laws change all the time. So you need to figure out a good basis for that, preferably through government communication, and organize your file. Have that ready. Um, finally, group structure matters. The ugly. Think about whether or not you're operating in a geopolitical environment where this kind of cross-border skirmish is possible, either in the trade context, which happens all the time. I mean, there are countries that are in perennial trade wars with each other that are not all that, you know, they're in the newspapers on like page 25 or in the context of certain more belligerent states that you think that, well, there might be some of that risk. At which point you want to have a group structure that would allow you to make the Cargill argument to the extent that it is economically feasible to do so, which means that you set up your supply structure in such a way that the two countries that are most likely to be at odds with each other are the two countries in which you have subs that have essentially revenue streams and good streams or other uh, business streams go through them so that you can always rely on one or the other to bring a bit claim a la Cargill. Now that might be tax prohibitive, and if it's tax prohibitive, you have a chat with your client, but whether or not you're more concerned about political risk or more concerned about taxes. Um, but these kind of structuring concerns fundamentally impact how you deal with government change in all sorts of varieties of ways. Um, so that's where I wanted to end my remarks and sort of see if we could get a good discussion going. Yes. Um, I was just about the so-called umbrella clauses. Ah, yes. Do you mean, it, rather than tax, do you mean, does an umbrella clause freeze the taxing regime in the host state at current rates? Um, no. An umbrella clause in its own right does not do that. You would need to enter into a separate stabilization agreement. Um, one of the key cases that that was a huge issue in was Pashuk v. Mongolia. Um, it, it, Again, full disclosure, I represented Mongolia in the case. And what we successfully argued was that um, the investor had an ability to enter into a stabilization agreement and failed to do so. Therefore, they were not entitled to claim with regard to a, a significant change in the tax structure. 68% windfall profits tax on all revenue from gold over $500 an ounce. Um, so you have to enter into separate stabilization agreements in order to freeze taxation or otherwise demonstrate that you had a reasonable belief that the tax structure would not change in the way that it did. Um, and I think it's hardest in many ways to do that with tax. I mean, tax change is something that with few exceptions are endemic. I mean, you know, you tinker with tax rates all the time in many countries. Uh, Apparently not in the United States. We like to lower our taxes. We tend not to like to raise them. Um, but most countries would, you'd consider that taxation changes, especially with regard to extractive industries, are something that ballparkish if it's not too extreme. You need to, you need to have some reason to say you expected it not to change. Um, and many agreements would include some provision that you could very reasonably say that about. 
Um, but if you don't, during your due diligence, tie that down, you're going to have a very hard time convincing a tribunal of it. I mean, it's more an issue of proof than it is an issue of fact in many ways, because you need to show to a tribunal to its satisfaction that you reasonably expected this tax not to affect you. Yes. It's hard. The way that I would phrase the argument is that you make a successor state argument and that you would stop the government from raising nationality as a jurisdictional defense, given that it is its own illegality that created the defense and ex injuria non oritur use. So you, the, 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 reprehensible act cannot give rise to a legal claim or legal defense. Whether that is going to work depends on just about how courageous your tribunal is. Um, I know arbitrators that would, without blinking an eye, do that. And I know arbitrators who, without blinking an eye, would just dismiss the case. Um, so there, the constitution of your tribunal is going to be very important because it goes to something that's a foundational consent issue. Uh, that said, it really comes to the point of, um, there's sort of an, a, an American saying of cutting off someone's nose to spite their face. I mean, to raise that particular defense is to rely upon the um, illegal military act in the first place as Giving, for, giving rise to some legal entitlement. And I, I think that would sit wrong with a lot of people. Uh, but, so I think there you'd have really the best argument to get around that particular problem. Whether it'll work, eh. Um, but I doubt on the bright, I don't know if that's a silver lining or not, but I would doubt that a Russian company would, would get expropriated in quite the same way that a Ukrainian company or uh, a company that has a equity or debt tie to one of the countries that is leveling sanctions against the Russian Federation uh, would be prone to expropriation. I mean, just pragmatically, I would hope that it would be an issue that we would not have in the same way. But you never know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now that the Crimea has been annexed, what do you think and on what grounds? What can be the claim against who uh, and on what grounds? Uh, can they bring, obviously, now the Russian Federation is going to apply to right? Because they have already cut the whole system from the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. There is already a rule in circulation. Mm -hmm. Most likely they need to file for an 
Mm -hmm. um, well, now, I'm trying to think very... The UK, if I'm not mistaken, has a BIT with the Russian Federation, and I believe it's one of the old model BITs that permits arbitration only with regard to compensation for expropriation. I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look that up again. But I think it's one of the old school uh, Russian BITs. If that's the case, you'd, if you wanted to rely on that BIT, you would have to show that what happened amounted to a taking, and that would be a rather high hurdle. You'd have to overcome the significant additional problem that uh, the bit, if I remember correctly, is worded in terms of compensation for expropriation rather than the fact of expropriation, which may mean that you don't even have a consent to arbitration in the first place in that bit. So the better theory to my mind would be to move under the Ukrainian BIT that would have been available to you, and I don't know whether there is a UK Ukraine BIT. So you would say it's the successor state in that part? The best way of doing it would be to argue on a successor state liability for a simple reason, namely that you then have a plausible theory throughout as to why you're sticking Crimea or Russia at that point, with the expectation that you had from previous government officials. So that you essentially say that, well, I don't care who's in office and what flag is flying atop the building. The representation I got are the representations I got, and pay please. Um, so that you would have essentially the same theory throughout that you're proceeding against the successor and in interest of whom you were doing business with before, meaning that as a successor in interest, it had an obligation to maintain the same favorable conditions that its predecessor negotiated. I am not aware of a claim that takes it to that extreme, but I know that one is currently pending. Uh, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. There is a claim against Kazakhstan on the basis of a Soviet bit claiming against Kazakhstan as a successor state to the Soviet Union. Well, no, but that's, that's the closest analog that I can um, give you. There are various successor state problems that you, um, I mean, the other cases that I could think of aren't really more closely analogous. So, just, uh, so, sorry if I'm dominating the conversation. I just have one last question and then I want to ask. Because, now, now, remembering your uh, uh, previous lecture about, uh, uh, <coughs> about how our tradition is, uh, 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 the position of certain bodies actually want to limit themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. They first need to actually analyze that the action of the Russian or, or action of those people start. If they actually have to do this huge public international law, quasi ICJ kind of analysis and judgment, they would have to say that whatever was done there was attributable to the Russian state, that Russia was actually occupying it. They have to become very political. Absolutely. They have to make a decision that typically arbitra arbitration courts do not make in a sense, right? Because that would kind of go way beyond into uh, public international law to well, a very big extent. They're supposed to do that. Um, now, they're not supposed to take it away from the parties. So if, if neither party pled it, well, too bad for the investor. But if the investor has pled a case that the tribunal finds convincing on the basis of 
the successor state um, materials that are out there, then I see no reason that a bit tribunal wouldn't do it. The problem you'd run into is twofold. One is there is a war provision in most bits that essentially provides that the foreign investor should be compensated at the same level and in the same way as nationals of the host state. So to the extent that Ukraine isn't compensating Ukrainian companies for their losses, you'd have obstacle one. You could then try a full protection and security argument uh, on the theory that Ukraine wasn't sufficiently diligent to protect your investment against essentially the physical taking by a foreign power. The problem with that argument is that I don't think arbitrators would buy that Ukraine would have had the military possibility of protecting your investment against Uh, well, and, and, and I think you, you, you might have a tribunal that would find fault with that, but my sense would be that the defense um, of futility of moving their soldiers would, have been, would be readily understood under those circumstances, simply because, I mean, they move a soldier, the soldier dies. Um, Well, yeah. The parties would have to plead it, and the parties would. I, I very much doubt they just dismissed the case. Bit tribunals are public international law tribunals. They have been willing to enter into all sorts of areas um, of public international law, including human rights, including you know, traditional public international law issues. They do it. You'd have to educate them to do it. Um, but the fragmentation of international law has not gone so far as to prevent them to say, well, you can't deal with this. They've dealt with trade issues a lot when there were you know, competing WTO and um, investor state issues where the, the host state of the investment claimed that um, it was acting as, as legit in legitimate countermeasures to what the uh, other state was doing, I mean, fundamentally, all the sanctions that are put in place by the Western states are similarly suspect from an investor state arbitration point of view as also being fundamentally fair and equitable treatment violations because, well, there is a line of cases that say, no, countermeasures affect states. BITs protect individuals. The individual cannot be blamed for what's going on between the two states. Now, in this case, you'd of course make the argument that the individual is very much to blame, and you might have a chance of winning that argument. But um, I mean, these kind of things would be litigated on a regular basis in, in, in bit cases. And in the UCOS cases, tribunals have been willing to you know, go further than the European Court of Human Rights. And I think that shows a political commitment on the part of arbitral tribunals to be a strong judiciary in this field. Any more? Yes. Um, speaking of um, uh, organizing the investment, mm -hmm. if we're trying to organize uh, investment in a way to get a BIT protection, in an artificial manner, we would get such protection. For instance, when the Georgian citizens are um, establishing a Dutch TV and then investing back in Georgia, mm -hmm. There, there is a case in which a Ukrainian national incorporated a Lithuanian company, I think it was Lithuanian, and then reinvested through the Lithuanian company against, uh, in Ukraine, and then claimed against Ukraine for um, treaty violations. That case, 
led to one of the funniest things ever from just a practical point of view. The two wingmen on the tribunal, the two party appointed arbitrators, found jurisdiction. And the president of the tribunal dissented and resigned. That usually does not happen. Usually the president of the tribunal is not the odd one out that dissents. In this case, though, that's precisely what happened. And what the majority of the tribunal stated was that, no, you don't look to effective nationality. The requirement is that there be the company that is incorporated in the right place, and you don't get to pierce the veil in order to establish effective nationality beyond that. Meaning that you can, as it stands now, incorporate through um, bit countries, should you so choose. And um, there are people who do that from time to time. I have heard of prime ministers who have brought claims against their own country on somehow similar bases. I know, I'm not sure which country that would be, but I've heard of such thing. Um, so, I mean, this kind of stuff happens. Apparently they also settle their own cases afterwards, which also is interesting. Um, well, thank you so much. <laughs>